This conference will now be recorded. Welcome. Welcome to the December monthly partnership meeting of the Southeast and Caribbean Disaster Resilience Partnership. Good morning. My name is Heather McCarthy, and I am honored to serve as the executive director of SCDRP. I am speaking to you today from the festive clubhouse at Port 32 Marina at Ortega Landing, where I live in Jacksonville, Florida. Today's agenda, we have a packed one hour, so we are going to move through quickly. I'm going to cover um, who are we now? Just kind of a quick affiliation of member affiliate, quick overview of member affiliations. And then we have a super speaker today. Jessica Granis will be filling us in on resilience funding through the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. And I am extremely excited to announce the Dynamite speaker lineup for our annual meeting in Miami. And then get your calendars out because we have some critical deadlines coming up for meeting registration and hotel reservations. And of course, we are in the midst of advisory board nominations and election, so we will discuss some important dates and procedures to fill those six open seats on our expanding advisory board. And then we'll spend the rest of our time uh, hearing updates from you and your organizations. So as we look forward to 2023, who is SCDRP? The Southeast and Caribbean Disaster Resilience Partnership is a coalition of both public and private organizations that collectively seeks to strengthen community resilience and support rapid disaster recovery from storms and other types of disasters. So here are the backbone of SCDRP support. These are our group members. We have benefactor group members, uh, which donate over $5,000. Those benefits include four complimentary annual individual mem memberships and one third off of four individual registrations to our in-person meeting in Miami. Next up, we have the sustaining partner group members. Those donate over $2,500, uh, $2, and those benefits include three um, annual individual memberships, and all the benefits that come with those memberships, including the one-third off annual meeting registration. And then um, we acknowledge our four current supporting partner group members, Martin County, Miami-Dade County, um, Georgia Department of Natural Resources and our newest supporting partner group member, uh, Florida Institute, oh, excuse me, Florida International University Institute of the Environment, FIU. And with a supporting partner group membership, you get two individual memberships and, of course, one third off two registrations to our annual meeting. And of course, all group memberships include recognition on all SCDRP digital and print media, presentations, and meeting. So thank you to all of our supporting group members. And now I'm gonna show you a few slides of where our current members work. This is really interesting to me and I kind of compiled it all together so we could see uh, at a glimpse who we are. We have a very diverse group. And over the past decade, SCDRP has evolved into the largest cross-sector regional forum for resilience professionals from the public, private, academic, and non-governmental sectors in these fields in the region. Together, we recognize that the scale of disasters and climate-related impacts that our region faces requires both public and private organizations to reach beyond their individual mandates and vested interest to protect and transform climate high-risk communities. So is your logo missing? If you don't see your logo, it probably means that your membership has expired. If you're not sure, please reach out to me and ask. And remember, now is the time to rejoin. We are having a membership drive from now until January 31st. So please renew your membership now and you'll get the one third off registration to our upcoming annual meeting in Miami, Florida. 
Next up, we have a very timely guest speaker today, Jessica Granis, Program Director, Coastal Resilience at the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Jessica Granis, who joins us from Washington, DC. Jessica joined um, NFWF in 2021 as the Program Director of Coastal Resilience. Prior to joining NFWF, she served as the Interim Vice, Pre Vice President for Coastal Conservation and the Coastal Resilience Director at the National Audubon Society. Before that, Jessica served as the Georgetown Climate Center's Adaptation Program Director for 10 years, and she taught as an adjunct professor at Georgetown University Law Center. At Georgetown, Jessica supervised research that focused on federal, state, and local climate adaptation efforts. Prior to her work at Georgetown, she was staff counsel for the California State Coastal Conservancy and the Ocean Protection Council. She received her LLM from Georgetown Law and her JD from the University of California Hastings College of the Law and her BA from the University of Chicago. It is my pleasure to present Jessica Granis. And now I will make Jessica a presenter. Great, thank you, Heather. And hi, everyone. Nice to be asked to participate in this conversation. Um, and I will pull up my slides. Are you seeing my slides, Heather? Yes, I see your slides perfectly. Looks good. OK, perfect. So hi, again, my name is Jessica Granis. I'm the program director for coastal resilience at the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation or NIFWIF. Um, if you're not familiar with NIFWIF, we are a 501c3 charitable foundation that was created by Congress um, to be a, a place to leverage public sector dollars with private sector dollars to maximize the conservation impact that we can have on the ground. And my program, the program that I help administer, the National Coastal Resilience Fund, is one example of over 60 programs that we administer at NIFWIF. Um, so the National Coastal Resilience Fund is a national program focused on helping enhance the resilience of coastal communities to the impacts of rising sea levels and more intense storms, um, more frequent erosion, and also um, support nature-based solutions that have the benefit of improving habitat for fish and wildlife. This is a program that was created by Congress and first funded in 2018 um, as a program to support these nature-based solutions that provide the dual benefits that that of both reducing risk and improving habitat it's a program that we administer in partnership with the national oceanic and atmospheric administration um, and it's an, on an annual cycle so i will give a, a high level overview of the program um, we are really looking for those kinds of nature-based solutions that help you reduce those risks and enhance habitat. We have the privilege and benefit of being awarded additional funding under the bipartisan infrastructure law that passed Congress last year. Um, so we will be making about 140 million available over the next several cycles of the program. That's the estimated amount. That amount changes based upon um, other funding op opportunities coming into the NCRF. Um, and our ability to leverage private sector funding to help support those coastal resilience initiatives in communities. Um, the interesting thing about the program is that we don't have any hard caps in terms of the amount of funding that you can request, though we do provide some estimated guideposts and average awards that we expect to come in. So for planning and design, grants, we estimate that um, those will be around the range of between 100,000 up to a million dollars, and then for restoration and implementation projects up to $10 million. Um, we also have a lot of flexibility in the types of entities that we can um, fund through the program. 
everything from state and local governments to tribes to nonprofits and universities and, and can even support for-profit institutions um, with, the, with the caveat that they can't take um, profit on a federal grant. Um, so what our funding model at WIF is to leverage those, those private sector or public sector dollars that we get from our main funding partner at NOAA with additional resources from other federal agencies as well as um, private contributions. So this year with the National Coastal Resilience Fund, we were excited to formalize a partnership with the Department of Defense where we leveraged an additional $15 million in funding um, to support projects that benefit military resilience. And then we also have our regular um, private sector contributor, contributors from TransRay, um, Shell USA, and Occidental. And this year we leveraged additional funding to support projects that also have a, a carbon sequestration benefit um, with funding from the Bezos Earth Fund. So our, our National Coastal Resilience Geography, where we can fund, the program is focused on coastal regions. Um, so we can fund in all coastal states and U.S. territories, including the Great Lakes. Um, but we recognize that what happens in the upper parts of coastal watersheds can affect the health and safety of coastal communities and ecosystems. Um, so if you're interested in learning how far inland we can go, um, this map of our geographic boundaries is available on our website, um, on our program tab, and it it's delineated based upon coastal Huckate watersheds that drain to the ocean or the Great Lakes and adjacent Huckate watersheds that are particularly low lying or tidally influenced. And so we get up um, into the upper reaches of, of coastal watersheds. So there's a lot of ability to do work um, inland. Again, the program focus is really on those nature-based solutions that provide those dual benefits. So we're looking for projects that restore and enhance natural coastal features, um, like restoring oysters and seagrasses and coral reefs, um, projects that enhance um, and restore beach and dune habitat, living shoreline projects, projects that restore coastal forests and wetlands, and we also can fund green, gray, or hybrid solutions that deliver outcome that deliver the outcomes of both reducing risk and improving habitat. So with those green, with those gray solutions, we're looking for um, gray infrastructure that's needed to reduce to to improve ecosystem function and quality. So examples of that are projects to remove dams or upsize culverts and reconnect floodplains and we've also funded some more traditional urban green infrastructure projects that are designed to reduce stormwater flooding in neighborhoods so there's a broad array of solutions that we can support through this program another strength <clears throat> excuse me another strength of the program is that we recognize that communities are at different places in their work to build resilience and to meet the needs of communities we've developed a pipeline approach to funding our projects so we can fund um, everything from early stages of project planning um, and community capacity building through site assessment and preliminary design to help communities home in on those types of nature-based solutions that that and test whether those um, solutions will help them reduce risk in their area all the way to final design and permitting of those selected solutions and then finally construction restoration and implementation um, and our restoration implementation projects we have a requirement for one year of post-construction monitoring because we really want to test and make sure that these solutions are working on the ground and delivering both the ecosystem and ecological and resilience outcomes that communities are seeking. Another large priority for the National Coastal Resilience Fund is ensuring that the funding is going to the most un underserved communities that face disproportionate climate risks due to socioeconomic factors like poverty and unemployment. 
Um, in our me most recent 2022 request for proposals, we made some significant changes to the RFP to reduce barriers to those underserved communities to help them access these funds. The first thing we did was to add language at the very top to sig signal that underserved communities are a, a big priority for the program and we want to see projects that both benefit underserved communities and directly engage communities in the work. Um, the other change we made was to significantly soften our ma match requirement. In previous cycles of the NCRF, we had had a one-to-one -one match requirement, but working with our partners at NOAA, we were able to soften that to strongly encourage match, but not require it. Um, and one thing to note is that there are many ways to um, satisfy, uh, bring match to the table, because we know that projects that have a lot of partners um, that have uh, that have the community bought into the work are more sustainable and more successful in the end and so that match helps to show that there's broad support for a project um, but that match does not have to be cash so you, we count things like volunteer hours so if you're working with volunteers and bringing them out to the project site to support restoration that can count as match in-kind support. So if people are letting you use workspace or um, facilities to host events, that can all count. Direct indirect or uh, deferred indirect costs can be uh, counted as match. And so there are many different things to look at to, to show that there's broad support for the project and that there's match being contributed to the work. Um, and then finally, we recognize that capacity building and the types of um, activities that our funds can can support is also a, a huge priority for underserved communities. So we've worked with our team internally to make sure that 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 NCRF funds can support things like paying stipends to community members to value and um, pay them for their time to engage in the work, um, helping community-based organizations set up the capacity they need to be able to manage not only an, a grant from the NCRF, but federal dollars more broadly. So paying for things like accountants and accounting systems, and also covering the personnel costs. We know that staffing for smaller community-based organizations for smaller um, local governments is a real challenge. And so one thing you can do with these grant funds is make sure that you have that staff time covered to implement the project and, and successfully um, move the work forward. So in your region, I'll just walk through now some examples of the, the projects that we funded in 2022 on our grant slate, slate that was announced last week in New Orleans. Um, so the big picture is that in the Southeast and the Caribbean region, we made 16 grants um, uh, with more than 25 million in funding and leveraging uh, 11.6 million in, in match contribution from partners. And so I'll walk you through um, a couple examples across the, the categories, planning, design, and implementation, and then, and then we can discuss if you have any questions, that this will be a very high level um, bird's eye view, overview of, of the projects in the region and a lot of great work being led by, by your colleagues and probably some of the folks on this call. Um, so in terms of some of the planning grants we made in 2020, 2022, um, I'll give you examples of three from the region. One was a $450,000 grant to the Glynn Environmental um, Coalition that will support resilience planning in, in one of Georgia's poorest and most at-risk communities. Um, the grant was to support a community-driven resilience planning effort that will um, have a strong engagement component to engage residents in the resilience work that's being led. Um, another grant uh, was made to Manament Inc. that will include support from the coastal states organizations and work with state agencies in Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina. Um, and the purpose for this work is really to identify sites for supporting beneficial use of dredge materials um, projects with you, that will use core dredge materials to support habitat restoration and resilience projects 
Um, so trying to get those um, dredge materials on the ground to support really strong habitat and resilience projects. Um, and then in Puerto Rico, we made a grant to a community-based organization that will support a community-driven resilience planning initiative in Ponce Bay um, and help the community identify sites where nature-based solutions can help them reduce flood risk in um, an area of Puerto Rico that's been significantly affected by recent storm events. And then in terms of both preliminary design and final design projects, I'll share three examples from your region. Um, we made a grant to Groundworks Jacksonville. This is a, one of our pipeline projects. We supported early preliminary design um, for this project and this grant will help them advance to final design and um, permitting. This is a community led project in Jacksonville that will develop final designs and advance permitting for restoration of Hogan's Creek um, with the goals of reducing flooding, improving water quality and creating habitat for an underserved area of Jacksonville. And then further south in Florida, we made a grant to Miami-Dade County to develop final designs and permitting for a 135 acre restoration project adjacent to Biscayne National Park. Um, and this project is interesting because it will show how wetland and coastal forest and mangrove restoration um, can be deployed to reduce flood risk in a, in a more urbanized area of the state. Um, and then we made a grant to the Georgia Department of Natural Resources to support development of 50% designs of a nature of nature based and hybrid solutions for reducing flood risk in, in Brunswick, Georgia. So this will um, leverage and align with some of the planning work that is also happening in this area. And then in terms of restoration implementation projects in your region, three examples here um, are a grant to the Ocean Foundation to restore 695 acres of mangroves in Hobos Bay um, in, co in collaboration with the National Estuarine Research Reserve. Um, and then another grant to the South Carolina Coastal Conservation League to work with military partners to support con um, construction of living shorelines to protect military assets at Paris Island. Um, and then finally, in August, we made a pipeline grant to a project that will help the South Carolina Department of Nat Natural Resources advance um, a project where we had er earlier supported final design and permitting. They're now advancing to restoration implementation. Um, and this grant will help um, support a community volunteer led restoration effort in West Ashley, which is an underserved area of Charleston. And again, it shows how um, sort of easier restoration techniques that can be led by volunteers can be implemented in a more urbanized uh, watershed to both reduce flood risk, but also improve habitat in this region. And so that's my bird's eye walkthrough of some of the projects that we funded in your region this cycle. Um, I wanted to give you a little preview of the NCRF timeline so that you have um, a knowledge of when our RFP is released and when deadlines um, for seeking funding come, come up. Um, so we typically try to have our RFP out um, in the early spring. We're looking to try to get the RFP out uh, by February this year, but typically it comes out in early March. Um, so you can look for that to come out on our website. Pre-proposals are due in early April. Um, in May, we invite proposals uh, to submit full, full proposals. And then those are typically due in June. And we bring a slate of grants to our board in November and award decisions and announcements go out shortly thereafter. Um, another aspect of our program is that we have a team of field liaisons that work with applicants to help them develop competitive proposals and uh, navigate and understand not only our funding program, but also the landscape of other, uh, other funding programs that are, that are out there, particularly with the, the bipartisan infrastructure law funding um, that has increased 
the amount of resources available for this type of work. Um, Thoreau Environmental has brought on the Native American Fish and Wildlife Society and the American Society of Adaptation Professionals to their team this year. Um, so we're really excited that they have a specific tribal expertise and have brought on um, at folks that can help applicants understand how to incorporate climate change and future conditions into their project designs. So if you're looking for support and interested in the program, you can reach out to, to directly to them. Um, they're contractors to us, so there's no charge to the, the applicant to seek their assistance. They're, they can work with you and, and help you understand the program. Um, and that is my walkthrough of the NCRF and some of the work we've funded in your region this year. My, my contact information is here and always happy to, to connect with folks that are interested in the program. And so I will take down my slides because I cannot see anybody um, <laughs> and look forward to chatting. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jessica, for that timely update. I'm sure that the places or the organizations strike a chord with many of us here. I know the the Hogan's Creek and Greenworks Jacks, very, I'm very familiar with their projects and the contributions they're bringing to the urban core here in Jacksonville. So now I'd like to spend about five minutes question and answer time here from you. So you've got a couple options. You can type your question in the chat box or raise your your virtual hand to ask Jessica a question. When speaking, please don't forget to unmute yourself. And if you like, turn your camera on, please. Questions for Jessica. I see a question from Brian Johnson. Yes, sir. Somebody has to go, right? Yes, <laughs> let's make it you. Jessica, thank you so much. That's great. Um, you know, as a huge fan of science and scientists who actually make things happen, high five, virtual high five. Um, <laughs> my position is a little bit unique as I bring solutions, usually hard solutions. And obviously we want to do the best we can to preserve and rebuild the natural uh, coastline. But while we're working through this and these storms are increasing in size and magnitude, um, is there a lot of talk about incorporating these other type of solutions in while we're working on these natural shorelines? Because once we do that, it's gonna take some time to get them fortified to where they will be able to do that job. So the, is the question sort of the mix of green gray that we could right, support? A hybrid type of solution, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so we do support hybrid solutions. I would say that um, with the NCRF, we are really focused on sort of those dual benefits. We want to see solutions that will reduce flood risk, but also improve habitat. And so I think what we've seen in terms of what we've funded in the past is helping communities evaluate um, the mix between green and gray in those planning and design stages. Um, once they're at implementation, the, the gray that we can fund really has to be gray that supports the, the ecosystem function and helps to enhance the ecosystem function and enhance the resilience of the, the habitat. Um, but we have seen a lot of our, we've had seen many of our grantees use our funds catalytically to help them develop project ideas that they can then take to an agency like FEMA that has more flexibility to fund more of the green gray and more, you know, focus more on sort of the structural flood solutions. Um, so we have seen grantees use our funding to help them develop those designs that then helps them leverage other and access other funding sources that focus more on the risk reduction pieces, if that helps. But no, we can't absolutely. fund that. So so long as there's that the habitat function is kind the of match. You have center. to match them together. Yeah. Because the other one that I see regularly, and this is, you know, anywhere where the city meets the water, which is almost every city that we, we're talking about, is when we get into these, you know, 
deep, dark industrial sections of the city where that meets the water and trying to keep our industry land side from getting into the bays and different, you know, waters that we do have. Because, you know, I, I read something, I happen to be located in New Jersey, though I work on projects around the globe. Um, and in New Jersey, there's some scary number, like 27 factories that have registered hazardous materials on site that are basically in the marsh. Yeah. So, I mean, as much as we need to grow our coastline back and preserve that, we also had to figure out how to keep our industrial friends kind of contained because I think that's another one. I mean, just alone in Sandy here in Jersey, you know, one of the things we noticed after the cleanup was happening is, you know, even something as simple as, as your mom and pop garage, the 55 gallon drum of oil goes over yeah. and that's it. It's out there. Huge impacts. Yeah. So the, I, I, I want to definitely further that conversation of the, the hybrid and where the green and the gray meet, because in certain areas, we're going to not be able to use only one or the other. Yes, for sure. Yeah. Awesome. We, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Brian. It yeah, looks like, um, yeah, it sounds like a, a hybrid is in every, in, in everyone's minds and trying to have dual outcomes, multiple outcomes of, of these projects. I see Vamsi has raised his hand. Vamsi, what's your question? Hi, Heather. Uh, thank you so much, Jessica, for the uh, wonderful talk. Uh, unfortunately, my camera seems to be conking out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, my question is, uh, do these projects that you fund uh, typically have to be associated with specific communities? Uh, do you also fund projects that look at uh, large at the larger regional context and uh, how um, coastal resiliency works uh, between different connected or neighboring communities? Uh, and and maybe that uh, sort of uh, project would lead to uh, some sort of uh, resiliency and habitat restoration infrastructure development down the line. Do you fund those kinds of uh, initiatives? Yeah, so we do encourage um, our applicants to look broad and look beyond their their immediate kind of jurisdictional boundaries because we know that climate change is not going to stop <laughs> at your 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 boundary line. Um, and we have supported projects that take a regional approach. So the example from your region on, on this slate was the Manomet project that's looking at one type of restoration approach using beneficial use of dredge materials, helping the states understand dredging schedules and knowing how to deploy those dredge materials to um, beneficial restoration projects like thin layer placement to build up marshes to help them adapt to rising sea levels. Um, we've funded projects in the Great Lakes through the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence City Initiative where they're working across the entire region to help develop plans and advance communities to site assessment and preliminary design of nature-based solutions that will work for the Great Lakes region. Um, we've supported work in Alaska across 60 Native communities uh, through the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium to build their um, just baseline data understanding of, of the risk in those communities and help them develop um, plans that will not only help them leverage uh, future NCRF funds, but access funding from FEMA, have hazard mitigation plans on the books that can help them access funding from FEMA. So we do have um, many projects that take a, a more regional approach and that are working across communities and jurisdictional lines. And we definitely encourage that. Okay, thank you so much. Fantastic. Certainly that is that is why we all are here today too, is we know the, the benefits of a regional approach and regional reach. I see um, Richard. Richard, did you have a question? Yes. Richard Butler, Army Corps. You may be, I can't hear you if you're speaking. You may be muted. Let's see. Ah. All right, sorry about that. This is uh, Rick Butler with the Corps of Engineers. I'm a biologist. Can you hear me?
Uh, your sound is going in and out. Try one more time. Yeah, I just want, I know that some people are having some issues with uh, the microphone. Can you hear me? Yes, now I can. All right, great. Thank you so much. Uh, Rick Butler, Corps of Engineers. I'm a biologist and the Silver Jackets lead down here in Jacksonville District for um, for essentially working with um, uh, our other partners in my in uh, Florida, Puerto Rico, and USVI. And so I've had a few questions recently. Um, one recently uh, with respect to a potential application that they, that a um, nonprofit submitted down in Puerto Rico. So I'm trying to understand, and I'm not sure if everyone's aware of what Silver Jackets um, is. I can give a quick overview, essentially. But um, but I wanted to, you know, essentially we're an in, in interagency team. Uh, you know, let, you know, basically we at the core work with other state, federal, and tribal and local agencies to like learn from each other, work together to reduce risks from floods and sometimes other, like other natural hazards. And so we were approached by a nonprofit essentially saying that they applied to your fund and they're trying to understand, you know, trying to collaborate. And so I'm trying to understand the relationship that and I know that we have proposals that we submit and a lot of invest, you know, we really bring the resources of all the agencies together to have a discussion. So I'm, I guess I'm kind of understanding this as like we would kind of partner with you all as kind of an interagency group, and then they would approach you possibly for implementation funding. Is that kind of understanding it? Or maybe you have your hand in, in, in uh, both buckets. I, I'm just trying to understand that. And I sent you a text, a uh, little message about uh, uh, somebody who reached out to us from a nonprofit. That was my question. Yes, and I am in pretty regular contact with Anthropocene Alliance. If you, if all, you all are familiar with Anthropocene Alliance, they provide, um, they're a network of community-led organizations working to enhance flood resilience in their communities um, with a focus on the most marginalized, most underserved communities. Um, so they can help, they are working with those those um, organizations to help them develop project proposals to NCRF and, and other funding sources um, and are a really great resource for community-based organizations. Um, in terms of Silver Jackets, we have supported projects that have come out of Silver Jackets processes. Um, and so, yes, if you are developing project ideas through a Silver Jackets collaboration, and CRF is a good place to look for implementation funding. I would say that we wouldn't be able to support sort of Silver Jackets activities. One restriction we do have is not being able to fund federal partners um, with some exceptions, few exceptions, but um, for you know not supplementing another agency's budget, we often cannot support a federal effort. So we can support the state and local governments that are collaborating through Silver Jackets, but not the, the federal personnel. I see. Excellent. I, I hear you loud and clear, Jessica. Can you hear me? Yep. And know that Silver Jackets is supported, so that's not necessarily a need, but just wanted to make that clear if that was the case. No, 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 no. I totally understand that. So my understanding, at least, you know, we can have an offline conversation, is they were reaching out to us. They were mentioning, you know, obviously. I'm sorry? Oh, yeah, happy to, to have yeah. an offline conversation. So just feel free to reach sure, out. Sure, sure. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks, Rick. It looks like we have one more question in the chat box, and this comes from Carrie Farinas. Uh, she says she has no access to a microphone. Her question is, do you fund activities that evaluate the efficacy of nature-based solutions implemented in your funded projects or more broadly? Yes, so we have a couple of contracts that we are working with to evaluate our portfolio of projects that we funded since 2018. Um, and that the intent of that work is to do um, flood risk modeling and socioeconomic assessment to look at the uh, risk reduction benefits delivered by the projects that are implemented with NCRF funding. Um, and to also evaluate the ecosystem service benefits delivered by those projects. Um, that work is midstream now. We're hoping to have some preliminary case studies ready to share around our five-year anniversary and um, more to share on that front as that, that work um, 
continues. So definitely Fantastic. look for more there. Fantastic. Thanks for writing in that, that question, Carrie. And I think um, we'll wrap up the question and answer period. And thank you so much, Jessica, for that timely update. And um, if you need to bow out, um, that is fine. We thank you for your time today. We know this is a very, very busy time for you. Thank you again. Thank you. And I will put my um, email address in the chat. So if anyone has other questions or want to reach out, please feel free. Perfect. Thanks all. Have a good rest Perfect. of your week. Bye. Thank you so much, Jessica. Bye-bye now. I will go back to sharing my screen. We have a few more partnership updates. Okay, now you should be able to, to see my screen. Again, fantastic, uh, fantastic update from NIFWIF. Appreciate that. All right, let's move on to um, some partnership news. So our SCDRP 2023 annual meeting is coming together. And there's nothing quite like getting together in person, is there? This is really where we build partnerships, we create collaborations, and we make massive strides towards our collective goals. So our steering committee has been working diligently for four months now, and I am absolutely ecstatic to reveal today some of the outstanding speakers that we have lined up. Uh, first up, um, as is tradition, we will have a resilience update from our states and territories. We will have coastal zone managers coming from North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, and our Caribbean territories, Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico. The next session is on shelter. So this is all types of shelter before, during, and after a disaster. From HUD, we'll have a representative, uh, Aaron Gagne, City of Charleston um, has invited, we've invited the Chief Resilience Officer. And um, we've also invited a representative uh, from SBP out of, uh, coming out of New Orleans. Session three, we have a couple um, Caribbean focused sessions. We're making a concerted effort to bring in um, speakers from our Caribbean partners this year. In the first session, this is um, <clears throat> sponsored by USGS, St. Petersburg. It's the International Caribbean Knowledge Exchange. So we share many of the same vulnerabilities as our Caribbean partners, and we have much to share with each other. First up, Dr. Jer Jeremy Colomore from um, University of the West Indies in Jamaica has been confirmed. And then we will have representatives from Five Seas in Belize, Sedima and Nima in the Bahamas. The next, we move on to a two-part session. The first session is uh, Miami-Dade and Wider Caribbean Knowledge Exchange, Meeting the Moment on Climate. And this session will be moderated by Mayor Levine Cava from Miami-Dade County. We, are, we will also have um, representatives, uh, local commissioners, the special advisor to the UN Secretary General on Climate Action has been invited. We hope to have a representative from Vice President Harris's US-Caribbean Partnership to address the climate crisis 2030. That's PAC 2030. Um, and then we have others from the Adrian Arsh Rockefeller Foundation Resilience Center at the Atlantic Council have been invited and also representatives from the Consular Corps uh, down in Miami. So this session is coming together and should prove to be very exciting. We're bringing together people who can help us talk about how to build relationships that really can lead to policy changes. The next part of this session is more academic in focus. So it's called Leveraging the Deep Bench, University Partners and Local Governments Working Together to Advance Climate Action. So we're bringing in a representative from U.S. Department of Agriculture and University of West Indies has several campuses, one in St. Augustine, another one in Mona, and then we have a confirmed speaker from NOAA to address some of these issues. 
should be exciting. Session five, rapid recovery. So this is where we talk about how do we deal with disasters that come one right after the other in succession. We've barely recovered from one when another one hits. We'll bring in um, invited guest, Jesse Spiro, Miami-Dade County. Um, he is a confirmed attendee of the Duke Roundtable and we're hoping to get a little more time hearing from him. We'll, we will bring in um, FEMA, practitioner and here's where we want we really want to bring in some speakers who talk about um, the fiscal side and funding risk management insurance etc the next section is community-based risk uh, risk reduction. St. Lahaitian Neighborhood Center is definitely speaking. Catherine Mock from University of Miami is coming and um, Dr. Shanker Brown from Stetson who focuses on equity issues and Clio Institute is also going to be there. Um, we have eight sessions. This is session seven uh, where we really talk about building effective partnerships. We have um, Pamela Burkowski uh, one of our very own members from Blue Sapphire Strategies to talk about um, uh, some of the South Florida military installations, the South Florida Defense Alliance. We have a representative from South Florida Regional Planning Council coming, Jacobs Engineering, Holly Schmidt. Uh, Mark, you're speaking too from um, University of Georgia Marine Extension, Georgia Sea Grant. Thank you. And um, we also have a representative, uh, Matt Schrader, He's a coastal engineer and planner here in Jacksonville District who will be speaking from the Army Corps perspective. And lastly, uh, last session on the second day is a holistic approach to climate and resilience equity. We're bringing in some of some speakers who focus on social justice issues. Um, the moderator for this session will be Jane Gilbert. She's the chief heat officer in Miami-Dade County. We've invited Kathy Dello, North Carolina State Climate Office, Catherine Coleman Flowers, um, White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council. She's been invited to speak. She's confirmed for the Duke Roundtable immediately following our meeting, and we're hoping to get a little more time with her. And Brock Long, who's also confirmed for the Duke Roundtable, he's the keynote speaker on um, Wednesday night at the Duke Roundtable dinner. Um, he's the former FEMA administrator, and we hope to get a little more time from him as well. Okay, so exciting lineup, right? Keep in mind all of these speakers, the emails are flying, um, changes and confirmations are happening in real time. So this is just kind of a, a glimpse of where we are today, but I hope that it gives you a feel for the folks we're trying to bring together, what we're trying to do <clears throat> in Miami. <clears throat> So <clears throat> here's the hard deadlines that you need to know. Uh, January 5th, um, we are bumping up against the holidays here, so please pull out your calendar and mark these dates down. Thursday, January 5th is the deadline to get the hotel room at the Novotel Miami Brickle for $199. We have a room block, it's filling up, so please make your reservations today. If you have trouble with the link, the reservation link, um, I know some of you are, please reach out to me. And my recommendation is it works sometimes and not other times, so keep refreshing and you um, hopefully you will find that it works. The next deadline to keep in mind is Tuesday, January 10th. This is kind of the drop dead deadline to register for the annual meeting in Miami. And we need to let catering know how many people are coming. So that's, that's our final deadline. All right, what else do we have going on? We are in the middle of an advisory board election. So remember, as, um, as a member in good standing, you get to vote in the first official SCDRP advisory board election. So we've written new policies and procedures, we're growing, and we're adding six additional advisory board members. To accommodate this, we're extending the deadline, okay? We're extending it to the end of the year, December 31st. Feel free to nominate yourself or another member, and nominations are occurring online right now. They're coming in through that Google form that's linked in the newsletter or on our website. So remember, we're, we're looking for six open seats. They fall into the categories of someone from the state of South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, 
one open seat for U.S. Virgin Islands, one open seat left for nonprofit organization, and one open seat left for local government. <clears throat> so um, please reach out if you have any questions. Okay, we have a few minutes left, <clears throat> and now we would we would love to hear from you. So please use the chat box, or please raise your hand, share your announcements. Um, and if we don't get to you uh, today, please use the the ge generic web um, email address sedrp at sakura.org to reach all of us. Who has any? Does anyone have any announcements? All right. <clears throat> if you do, if you think of something, please feel free to email us. Email us at any time. Oh, yes, sir. I see Brian. Hand up. Come Turn on. off your May mic. Well go, may as well go for one more. Okay. <laughs> Just wanted to report in the world of flood mitigation, flood proofing, um, there are some really great things happening down in Fort Lauderdale. There's a manufacturer mm -hmm. called Fenex who has now gone through the FM ANSI 2510 uh, testing for storefront windows that are 11 feet tall by 10 feet wide so mm. we've got a lot of new and exciting technological advances coming in the commercial space because if you look into 23 residential may slow down a bit but that commercial there's a lot of cranes out there if you guys are in any any cities you'll see them so a lot of okay. great solutions if there's anything we can do to help anybody whether it's insurance or just overall solutions even if they forgot we've got a project in south carolina that got built three quarters and they never took flood mitigation into the fold. So crazy things happen, we're here to help. Oh, thank you, Brian. <clears throat> I appreciate you speaking up. All right, well, I'll go ahead and uh, wrap up for <clears throat> today if no one else has any announcements. Just want to say a special thank you to our super speaker today, Jessica Granis. Such great work that they are doing um, there at NIFWIF. And a big thank you to you for joining us today and your continued contributions to the Southeast Caribbean and Disaster Resilience Partnership. Thank you again and happy holidays to you and yours. And I will see you in Miami next year. Thank you. <laughs>